He's going on a trip with his wife. She gets in a carriage because that's the done thing if you're a wealthy woman. And he's riding on a horse on behind because it's unmanly to get in a carriage. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Ask the Expert with Steph. Hello, and welcome back to Ask the Expert, where our expert guest answers questions from you, our listeners. I'm your host, Steph Storr, and I'm here today with our friend, the brilliant author and historian, Ian Mortimer. Welcome. Oh, thank you very much for asking me back. Of course, we'd love to have you. So today's topic is so interesting and we've got a lot to cover, but we're going to, and so we're going to discuss actually the, the speed of information and travel in the 16th century. So this is something that's so interesting and we got a lot of questions to get to, but before we start, can you tell us a little bit about your research or how you got interested in this topic? Speed is one of those subjects that no one's really looked at at all for, for, for the pre, um, pre-industrial period. The, the very first point to which I thought, hang on, I must really do something about this, was when I was writing, uh, in the very early stages of writing The Time Traveler's Guide to Elizabethan England. And I noticed that in 1603, the news of Queen Elizabeth I's death was taken to Scotland in the spring at roughly twice the speed that Edward I's death was announced to his son in London in 1307 in the height of summer. And I thought, hang on, there wasn't any technological change between 1307 and 1603. How was it that that piece of information, which you can define as equally urgent, was taken so much more quickly to Scotland and uh, in 1603? And so I, th- I started looking into speed at that point, and I had already had a sort of passing interest in it, collecting dates from Middle Ages on uh, how fast people could travel. And then I started sticking it all together, and I realized that the whole medieval period – and I mean, in, in, into the 16th century too, just saw a greater and greater quickening of the speeds at which news and people could travel. So that's when I started to get excited, because when you realize you know something that nobody else does, that, that is really what, what it's all about as a researcher. So what did you come up with as the answer to, to that question? Oh, well, that's a very long series of answers. Um, there's definitely a, a, a philosophical change in how speed matters. Things that facilitate it are you know, better bridges, pretty obviously, better roads, pretty obviously, um, better bred horses, slightly less obviously. But the real infrastructure is the organization. How many horses have you got available to choose from? How often can you choose them? Who is paying for cho- uh, you know, sending them along? And most of all, it's the shift to clock time. In the earlier Middle Ages, people obviously had a, a vision of time that was God given. 12, 12 uh, daylight divided into 12 in the um, uh, in summer was uh, an hour twice you know, an hour was a 12th of the daylight so an hour in summer was then um, twice as long in summer than it was in winter when they introduced or when the the powers that be Ed, under Edward III introduced clock time in the 14th century they shifted to a, a sense at which People regulated their their days much more because you could with the bells ringing out on the mechanical hour. And it's Edward III, in fact, who brought in the the whole idea of stages and uh, royal messenger services So uh, and speedy royal messenger services. So it's really the organization and the means to pay for it that make everything change. I want to touch on something that you just mentioned about the royal messenger services. Uh-huh. One of the questions that we see from that we received from our listeners was actually about these messengers. Who were these royal messengers, and is this is this a career that people aspire to be? Oh yes. Or did people just find someone and say, "Okay, I'd like you to start, you know, sending my my messages for me." If you can afford a messenger to spend his time taking your message and you're an important person, obviously you're an important person, if you can afford to employ somebody on that service and pay their all expenses, then you don't trust your messages to just anybody. In fact, news and important messages like that are some of the most um, valuable things, although it's not really a thing, uh, that you could entrust somebody with, your secrets. So no, you're not just going to find somebody and uh, send them off. The Royal Messenger Service was started 
I can't remember exactly when, but it goes back to the 13th century. And there were two sorts of messenger, a foot messenger and um, a, a rider. And the difference was not their speed, it was their status. So a foot messenger would take low status royal messages and a rider would take high status royal messages. So if a king was writing to a bishop saying, get here now, I need your advice on something, it would obviously be taken by a rider as quickly as possible. If he was just sending a message to uh, um, I don't know, one of his uh, manorial administrators somewhere, it may well go by a foot messenger. So there is a long tradition of um, the royal messenger service. Uh, some lords did have their, their, their me- no, messengers as well, their trusted household servants. But these were normally people within the household doing general duties. The royal family, or the, the English royal family, is quite quite um, uh, unusual in England in having a, uh, a dedicated office. And when, you're, when you ask, was this a career for life? Yes, it was. Uh, the people, I mean, sometimes people came in from non-royal messenger service, you know, serving, I don't know, John of Gaunt, somebody like that, brought into the, the royal uh, um, messenger service because precisely they what they knew. They had travelled to Avignon so many times, they knew the best routes. So they, they would um, therefore be uh, knowledgeable people you trusted to get there quickly and efficiently and also with great tact and diplomatic um, uh, skill. Because if you're taking the King of England's message, for example, across France, um, it's dangerous. Was it was it always dangerous or was it ever as simple as hopping on your horse or, you know, setting out on foot, depending on what kind of messenger you were, and then just going somewhere? Was there always the fear in them of some kind of danger? I mean, there's, there's lots of dangers. I mean, just in England, routine messengers are traveling... Normally, they travel in pairs. Um, so the Royal Messenger Service, they travel in pairs. So they uh, have somebody to, to watch out for them. And also, so an older man can teach the younger one um, which ways to go um, and basically how to do the job. Um, Travelling abroad, it's very dangerous. In England, you've got highwaymen and things like that. Crossing the seas, you've got you know, wreck, pirates, whatever. On foreign territory... You could be arrested as a spy because you're a foreigner on foreign territory traveling fast with important information. So although most messengers travel quite um, with, without any problem, you know, they are constantly on their guard and sometimes they don't reach their destination um, safely. And also you have to remember there are a few, and going back again to the Middle Ages, this is before 16th century, I'm afraid, but there are there are some people who deliver unwanted information to somebody and either are made to eat the letter they have just delivered or or worse happens to them so it's not a simple job being a, a messenger because you're only dealing with important information for high status people and that can uh, uh, get you into all sorts of difficulties now i know you had said that there was really the two different types foot or rider was there any water travel happening? Or I'm sorry, water, well, travel and delivery yep. happening. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, people who knew the routes of England and the new routes of France, going to Avignon, for example, from the Middle Ages to see the Pope or Rome or, or going across to, to Germany. They, they knew which ways to go. So they knew which roads to take. They knew where to hire horses. They knew when to get off the horse and then take a boat. Boats could, um, in certain areas, travel really fast. Um, in England, the, uh, well, the obvious thing to look at in England is the, 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 the Thames, the Thames estuary. Parts of the Thames estuary do move very, very fast when the tide is going out and there has been a lot of rainfall. So if there's a lot of water coming down the river anyway and it combines with the tide going out, then sometimes some parts of the river can be travelling at eight knots, so eight, eight nautical miles um, uh, per hour. Now, if you've got a waterman on there who can you know, row a skiff at four and a half knots, um, then... You can put those two together. You could be travelling at uh, well, uh, well, thirteen miles an hour. It really works out as um, there's no way you can travel uh, at thirteen miles an hour um, for a protracted period uh, on land, um, except in some extreme circumstances. There are some riders who can do it with a change of horses, but it's really, really expensive if you're doing it by horse on land for any distance. If you're travelling down the Thames from um, from let's say Windsor, you're going from a a, a part where the river is 
just the river and then into the estuary. And if you happen to get the the spate, the the the, the, the fastest moving water roller, um, you could travel very fast. But of course, it's only that narrow bit of the day when you're traveling that fast on the water. Um, I don't know if you realize, but estuarine rivers, they start moving faster and faster and faster until midway through. And as they get nearer the high tide or the low tide part, they start to slow up again. So it's only for a short while that you're really traveling at that speed. But even if you're just going down um, down the Thames and it's going at half that speed and you're rowing hard, then you're traveling much faster than people would do on the roads. Of course, the rivers don't always take you where you want to go. That's the problem. You know, you have to go where the river goes, um, whereas you can change direction on land much more easily and have, in many ways, a more efficient journey. And the, the most uh, famous uh, ferry routes are those between Lincoln and Boston and from London down to um, uh, Gravesend. It's called the Tilbury Ferry, the latter one. And that's a regular service, even in uh, Tudor times, whereby there's a ferry... Um, basically going from from London Dock down to, to, to Gravesend because it's so much more efficient to go by water down the south side of the Thames Estuary. And that's where you pick up the, the horses to ride on down into Kent and down to Dover to catch cross to catch a boat across to France. So there are regular recognized ferry routes. Um but the, your messengers they would have uh, recognized routes all over the country involving all the major rivers and knowing where to hire horses. Which are the How did they end up? Horses that coordinate with the river crossings. I meant I should have finished that sentence. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, how did they end up knowing where they were going? Were were maps and such at the time reliable? I don't know if you can imagine a, a 16th century map, but um, Elizabeth's reign sees the first sort of county maps in this country, uh, which are of any use whatsoever. But you've got to think that these aren't designed maps. Weren't they didn't exist in the 16th century to show people the way round. People knew the way round. The map was a geographical way of recording, well, it's a, a, a pictorial way of recording geographical information. So they, they thought the other way round. The, 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 the person looking at a map already knew his way round or her way round. Um, if you look at early 16th century maps, you can see this, they're quite crude, and you can see this um, philosophy very clearly. Um, I live on Dartmoor in southwest uh, uh, England, and the, the earliest map of Dartmoor is basically circles. It's got circles with churches at various points in it. Um, so there was no attempt to show you the way round. It's just a way of uh, recording geographical information in, 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 in two dimensions rather than, rather than text. Um, by the time of Christopher Saxton's atlas, which is in, comes out in Elizabeth's reign, there's a, a, a map of every county and the whole country. Uh, and, and that sort of shows every you know, town in relation to another, and it shows some of the major roads. But it's not the sort of thing that you would ever use to find your way around. Uh, it would be very costly to buy a copy, um, and it's far too large to carry with you. Um, people um, would go to a town and then on to the next town and then on to the next town along prescribed routes. So each <clears throat> route, say from London down to the West Country where I am, you'd, you'd go through uh, Maidenhead, Reading, uh, on to Salisbury, Salisbury down, uh, you, you um, to Taunton and on. You, you'd know these routes basically because you had asked people which way to go and there were recognised ways. Um, in 1600, there was a table printed. There's a copy in the Society of Antiquaries Library called um, a, a Table of the Chiefest Cities in, the, uh, in, in England. And it starts off with London at the middle of this circle. And then it's got in rings around it, each of the first stop you would go to, whichever way you were going from London. And that, I think, is the first... Well, it's the first um, uh, map or diagram of any sort I know, which is specifically to show people the directions they need to go in to get anywhere. Um, other than that, no, you, you would find your way by uh, doing what the messengers do and actually learning the routes or asking directions. We keep mentioning the word road in, in our conversation so far. Yeah. And I want to just clarify for everybody what, what a road would have looked like in the 16th century, because obviously they're not, you know, paving roads, but they're not necessarily only trekking through, you know, grass or something like that. So how did a road come about? 
Uh, about 3,000 miles of the ancient um, the, the Roman road system survived in use in England in the Middle Ages through to the 16th century. Um, if you've been on part of that, if you come across any stones left from that Roman road, they really wouldn't have helped you at all because they'd be so worn down and uneven, they just got in the way. Most highways were pretty rough. Um, the, the key to understanding the improvement of a road system is wheel transport because people can walk over and horses can ride over pretty rough land. So most roads, and when I say most, I mean well in excess of 99% of the roads in this country in the 16th century would have been basically mud. Mud and where something got too muddy, they'd have put down a lot of gravel to try and um, uh, dry it up uh, and make it passable. But the vast majority of roads were really in a bad way. Um, in some areas, uh, notoriously um, areas of clay, people would look at a road as somewhere they could just dig up some clay in order to repair their house. So I mean, there are instances of people drowning in puddles they walked into inadvertently as they'd gone along a road, didn't see a, a, a great big hole there because it was just a puddle, stepped into it, fallen in, knocked themselves out, drowned in, the, drowned in a road. Some roads, uh, certainly in the Middle Ages, were that bad. Um, 14th, 15th century, you have records like that. In the 16th century, there were mid, uh, in the mid 16th century, there were attempts to get the roads sorted out. Um, but it's only really when uh, wheel transport, as in wheeled um, passenger transport, comes in in Elizabeth's reign, that people start to uh, take this a bit more seriously, improve roads. Uh, very, very few towns have any paving whatsoever. It's it's pretty muddy in towns too, as well as the roads between them. I just want to circle back now to the messengers. I know we kind of started talking around that and got off on a little tangent there, but that's good because we answered a lot of those questions. <laughs> but back to the messengers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had said that that you know the royal messengers people had access to a a hired messenger for themselves. But as far as kind of the lay person or someone of lesser status, would they have access to messengers so that they could get news or information to to others that were far away if they didn't have money? So I'm almost thinking of kind of like a postal service, but not really. Does that make well, sense? No, 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 postal service, really. I mean, when I'm saying messengers, I'm talking about people who would be entrusted to carry messages themselves. The, the, there is a postal service set up in the early 16th century. Um, the, to explain what a post is and where the word comes from, it's uh, basically postal stations for a, 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 a relay. So um, the earliest I know in this country is one that Edward IV set up to uh, bring news from Scotland as quickly as he possibly as it possibly could be brought here. Um, I can't remember which year it was, but anyway, he set up a postal service to bring news from Berwick on the border of Scotland down to London in a, in a matter of ten stages uh, or ten posts. Kings um, Henry the Seventh set one up to tell him when uh, Catherine of Aragon had landed, and there are, there are specific ones set up for specific reasons. And then you'd have a, a messenger riding along those post, post stations. In I think it's somewhere around fifteen oh six. I don't think we actually know the exact date, but um, Henry the Eighth set up a, a, a master of the posts and um, a man called. Duke, I think his name was, and he was to supervise the king's posts on a permanent basis between Dover and London and London and Berwick, so Scotland, really. Um, and these were set up right in um, Henry VIII's reign. Now, at that level, you could pay to ride with the post. I seem to remember it cost three pence per mile and you had to pay the post boy uh, sixpence to take the horse back. That sort of postal system is a, a sort of messenger system, but it's designed to carry things for you. So your important messenger might ride with the post boy, but most of all, it's for taking government packages and government um, routine letters. And because it has to be funded on a permanent basis, 
the government allows people to ride with the post and they can ride quite fast with the post on the post horses and to send your own packages that way. So as long as you're not a pauper, as long as you're prepared to, to make that investment, you either could ride with the post, in which case you can go quite fast, um, or you can send a letter with the post. You can't send a letter with the post unless there is also a royal package going with it. Um, but if there is in the 16th century, your, your letter can go with it too. And this is the origin of the postal service. In Elizabeth's reign, there's another line down to uh, Plymouth and then um, up to Holyhead to go across um, to Ireland through Wales. And that last one's made permanent from 1598. Um, so by then, you've got a network of uh, postal routes uh, developing. Um, it's not as complex as we have, as there was on the continent, where there's m much better postal networks. Um, but England has started and developed it over the 16th century. And by the end of the 16th century, um, you could be, you know, Thomas Platt puts in his diary how he rode with the post down from Gravesend to Canterbury and did the the, the 50 mile stretch in um, five hours. Um, you know, he's riding at 10 miles an hour. That is pretty fast for road transport in the 16th century. Now, imagining we're, we're discussing then the people that, you know, as you said, are not necessarily paupers. They found their means to have somebody ride with the post, or with the royal post. Where did they, how do they know where to deliver the letters? Because, you know, if, if you're giving a message to a castle, then that's pretty easily identified, right? Yeah. But were there for the for the lower, the more common people, were there, you know, addresses? Did people's homes have addresses like we know them? Or no. how would they find where they're going? No, but the common people generally well, the majority were illiterate, so you wouldn't be sending them a letter anyway. Um you don't have that need to write to people um who are not of a reasonable status. They're not going to be part of a, a literary culture in that way. They might read the Bible, but they wouldn't necessarily expect to receive letters or send letters. Um, to, to, to look at towns, um, the larger city, so a city of you know, size of Exeter with about 8,000 people in it in the 16th century, that is a city that had names to its streets. Much smaller than that, Probably not. I mean, some some towns of three to four thousand people uh, might have had some streets named, but probably not all. And towns of two thousand people probably didn't have any names to their streets. So you had to arrive there and then ask where is uh, you know John Smith's house or whatever. If you were taking somebody a letter, um, in towns also people regularly stay at inns or ask for. And things to be deposited at inns for them. So when you look at um, letters, I mean, I'm quite interested in Shakespeare things. So uh, when you look at letters from um, the, the people of Shakespeare's time, often people are staying in London and you will see a letter addressed to a certain person at a certain inn in a certain parish um, or in a certain street in London because London streets were named. Uh, you wouldn't have an address as such, but the vast majority of people did not need an address for the very simple reason they weren't going to receive any letters. I just want to shift gears slightly now because I know that our topic today is um, information, obviously, which we've covered a little bit about already, and travel. And we've gotten a few questions from our listeners about travel and what it was like to travel back in the 16th century. Right. So... If one was going to take a trip, what would be what would it entail, and how much longer would the trip take if it was, you know, you, just you leaving for somewhere versus a royal entourage having to bring all their people and the caravans and the carts and all that kind of stuff? What what would it look like if you were going to go somewhere? Oh, well, that's quite a contrast, isn't it? Because you, I mean, the 16th century, you got the royal progresses of uh, Queen Elizabeth to compare everything to, and uh, I don't know if you're aware, but the royal progresses of Elizabeth were absolutely magnificent, immense spectacles, uh, and she travelled with between three and four hundred um, coaches and carriages and numerous riders and. Uh, the, the, the scale of her travelling was immense, and they were lucky if they did 10 miles a day. But, of course, when they went somewhere, they had to then have artificial 
banqueting halls, not banqueting halls, feasting halls and things like that made simply to cater for everybody she took with her. So the the, the speed there is sort of delayed by having to have things constructed and for the Queen's progress. So that, when the Queen moved around, when she shifted, it was about 10 miles a day maximum. Um, and compare that to her ancestor, Edward I, when he travelled around, he travelled around with many fewer via, you know, carts and carriages. Uh, he probably travelled with 20 to 30, and he habitually did 20 miles a day when he was travelling around. Um, his, grands, uh, his son, his grandson, sorry, uh, Edward III, travelled faster. Um, the fastest um, speed I have found anybody definitely covering in one day on a horse is 160 miles in a day um, on, on, when I'm sending a message. So if you could afford a change of horses and you could do uh, a route going straight up the, the, the main road towards Scotland, for example, where there were lots of places you could change horses, um, you could travel 160 miles in a day, whereas if you were traveling with very large numbers of people, uh, well, you'd be very hard-pressed to go f- faster than 20 miles. Just out of curiosity, then, who was that person that you said that you found went uh, 160 miles? I, I referred to him earlier. It's the first day of Sir Robert Carey's taking the message of Queen Elizabeth's death towards Scotland. The first day he did 163 miles in one go, in, in one day. Then he slept, and then he did 100 and I think it's 130 the following day. And then the third day he had ridden 90 miles and he fell off his horse and he cracked his head open and had to get medical help. Uh, but oh, still, still managed to get to Edinburgh this, on the third day. So that's 397 miles in three days, which I reckon is pretty good going. It sure is. So when he when he got there, uh, who does he go directly to? And then how do they make do they make an announcement or how does that how does it go to, to get the word out to everyone? Well, when he got there, of course, he went to go and see James to tell him he's now king of uh, king of England as well as king of Scotland and found the king had already gone to bed and had given instructions not to be disturbed. So he had to wait till the morning. Oh, (laughs) perfect. So the irony was he'd he'd done this fantastic ride. And there is one faster one I've come across, but I can't prove it actually took place. And I I found reasons to suspect it's not as as true as the person uh, claiming it. It, It's claimed by um, Robert Boyle's father, the the, the, the scientist Robert Boyle. Uh, His name was Richard Boyle and uh, uh, Earl of Cork. And he claimed to have got from Cork to London in 42 hours, which is technically possible, uh, but I, I have not, I found reason to doubt his claim. And so therefore, Sir Robert Carey is still number one on my fastest list. Now, if you were going to send a message or have a messenger or even deliver something yourself, which people had access to carts and carriages and things like that? Was that only the well-to-do you, you've got to remember that um, England is not like the rest of Europe when it comes to carriages. And not all of England uses carts. I mean, where I live, we didn't actually have any wheel transport until the very end of the 18th century uh, because this hilly area uh, is just not conducive to using wheel transport. So farmers used uh, pack horses and people who needed to transport, um, well, people of high status on the whole didn't come here. So You've got to have a different idea from thinking, oh, everybody's in a carriage or or using carts. In uh, the flatter central parts of England, yes, carts were used regularly for farm work and wagons were used regularly for farm work. But, of course, those don't travel very fast. Um, Carters did go between towns carrying things. So you would have slow-moving carriage wagons, rather, going from inn to inn down some of the the, the, the main roads, um, carting things around for people. But you wouldn't have traveled with those yourself. It's really just for for sending stuff. Um, Access to carriages. Now, carriages is the the interesting bit because although they'd existed in England since the 13th century, uh, in the Middle Ages, they were really only for um, old, very wealthy women. And when I say very wealthy, I mean countesses, etc. A a, a lavish carriage, um, one made by Edward III for his daughter, cost a £1,000. That's a £1,000 in a time when... Um, a, a, a chicken would cost you five pence. So um, if you think of something being worth, what, 
48,000 chickens. There you go. There's my unit of currency conversion for you. Um, it, it, it's, uh, or, or the equivalent of um, the chicken was a one day's, a day's work for some, a labourer. So if you think in terms of a labourer, 48,000 days work for, for, for a labourer, um, that's how expensive they were. And they were very few and far between and really only for countesses. And we didn't really bother with carriages until until really the mid 16th century and it's a product of the the protestant um revolution really obviously henry the eighth um made his split from rome and england became a an independent catholic country under henry the eighth uh and then edward the sixth sort of um made us took us more protestant um and under mary we reverted to the catholicism under Mary, a lot of the Protestant people who'd been enthusiastic supporters of Edward VI and his Protestantism went across to places like Antwerp, um, where they realised all these uh, uh, Protestants and uh, people on the continent and the Low Countries and in Germany, they're all driving around in carriages. How civilised. So a lot of those families, when they came back to England under Elizabeth, uh, they thought, well, we're gentry, we can afford it, we're going to have carriages made for us. The initial reaction in this country was that, okay, that's all right for women to do that, but men ride. And you have ludicrous situations in Elizabeth's reign where you'll be looking at uh, um, Sir William Cecil, for example, Secretary of State. He's going on a trip with his wife. She gets in a carriage because that's the done thing if you're a wealthy woman. And he's riding on a horse on behind because it's unmanly to get in a carriage. Um, that fades out over the course of Elizabeth's reign. But you've got to remember that this is a slow thing over Elizabeth's reign. And also before Elizabeth's reign, we really didn't have any carriages. Hence the appalling state of the roads, because it's only when you've got wheel transport, you need that steady surface to make it comfortable for the people inside. So access to carriages, yeah, virtually nobody apart from the wealthy before Elizabeth's reign, and I mean the very wealthy. And in Elizabeth's reign, you need to be pretty wealthy to, to, to have a carriage. It's not so much the carriage it's, um, th- itself by this, because they made them much cheaper in Elizabeth's reign. It's the horses to pull it, feeding all those horses and stabling those horses in towns, the destinations you want to go to. is really expensive. There are quite a lot of um, inns, in, in bills I've seen where it cost more to um, look after four horses for the night than it did the, the gentlewoman um, travelling and her servants. Well, isn't that interesting? That's that's such an, an interesting look at at why the roads kind of became what they became, and and how the carriages ended up in England. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, right. My pleasure. Yes, of course. So now, before I let you go, I know that I want to uh, keep you here for just a few more minutes because I want to give you an opportunity to tell all of our listeners about your new book that's coming out. I know it's very soon and you've done such a great job of answering all of our questions and we want to be able to support you. Um, so tell us about it. All oh, right. I guess it's called Medieval Horizons. And it really comes, um, it's been published tomorrow. That's a good thing. So tomorrow morning I'm heading up to London and going and launching it in Southwark Cathedral. Um, it's Medieval Horizons, why the Middle Ages matter. And it's a long Middle Ages because it's not about it's not trying to tell you about the Middle Ages, etc. It's trying to make you think about the past differently. Um, it, it comes from basically my activity as a practicing historian, going around talking to people. And, and I noticed when a book of mine came out called uh, Centuries of Change, which looks uh, changes over the last 10 centuries, that a lot of people presume that change is technological and that before the 18th century or before the, the scientific revolution of the 17th century, things didn't change very much. And... I noticed that um, a lot of serious historians like Yuval Noah Harari and A.C. Grayling and uh, and uh, Ian Morris and people like that were using this whole idea of technology to say that nothing really happened before the, the scientific revolution. And, and I, I couldn't help but feel this is just fundamentally wrong. And I found myself slipping in over and over again in talks I did to, to, to talk about this. And eventually it all coalesced into a whole series of um, examinations about how much changed before technology, how we went from a, a society in Europe which was dominated by war on a daily basis to one where we think, like Erasmus and Thomas More, that war is a bad thing and only to be, you know, to be avoided at all costs, or how we go from living in 
wooden single story smoky huts to living in fantastic um, residences like Hardwick Hall or, or, or Hampton Court Palace or places like that, you know, fine uh, buildings which have stood the test of time. Um, so I look at lots of uh, themes from the 11th century, which was pretty grim, let's face it. 20% of the population where I'm living now was enslaved, enslaved in the, the 11th century and how we you know, gained our freedom, got better living conditions and how ultimately we end up with a society which is very well represented by William Shakespeare who we often say speaks for us and yet he knew nothing about all this technology that's come since so I look at how the Middle Ages really formed the mentalities and the ways of life we expect in the Western world now. I think I'm I think I'm sensing another guest appearance on Tudor's Dynasty for you, Ian. <laughs> I think this is gonna be a great topic. So I really look forward to reading that again, everybody. It's called Medieval Horizons why the middle ages matter and it comes out well tomorrow but that means that by the time this airs it will be available and where do you think everyone can find it it's only being published in england and greece at the moment greece has decided to get to publish it but um england uh as it comes out tomorrow and i think everybody's waiting to see because no one knows what this book is like because like all my books it's um unpredictable it's not a normal uh theme it's not a normal approach so i think everybody's waiting to see how it does here before they launch in and think whether it'll be a american edition or a german edition or whatever well i'll do whatever i can to get you over here <laughs> right. i'll pull all the strings okie dokie thank you very much <laughs> thank you so again thank you so much for being here with us ian thank you so much to our guest ian mortimer um and our listeners who wrote in with all the questions. Of course, as always, we couldn't do it without you. And to everyone listening to this week's episode. As always, we appreciate your support and we hope you'll tune in again next time as we continue to ask our experts the pressing questions you want answered. And of course, if you love the Tudor's Dynasty podcast and want to show even more support, please consider becoming a patron where you'll not only receive the great content we offer now, but extra insider research, information, prizes, and other exciting opportunities only offered by subscribing. Until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.